I'm Stuart Sutton, Managing Director of the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. It's my pleasure today to first uh, provide a few comments about the webinar series and to introduce today's presenters. DCMI and ACES are committed uh, to both the research that drives innovative developments and the work that ultimately sustains practices in the real world. Our joint uh, webinar series is intended to advance our common commitments by providing both conceptual uh, webinars uh, that consist of overviews and insights into key topics of interest, as well as webinars that focus on technical issues and more practical matters that fuel developments that make you know, real differences in the lives of people. So today's webinar uh, combines aspects of both the conceptual and the practical. Today's webinar addresses learning resource discovery on the web by means of the educational extensions of LRMI to schema.org. Uh, our presenters are both well positioned to talk about LRMI since both have played significant roles uh, in the development of the specification and in its institutional positioning uh, for future development. Uh, Phil Barker uh, was a key contributor to the LRMI technical working group that developed the metadata specification. And both Phil and Lorna Campbell have been active in securing a sustainable path forward for LRI development and deployment. And both Lorna and Phil are with CETUS in the UK. Uh, you will have an opportunity at the close of uh, Phil and Lorna's presentation to ask questions. Uh, we will ask you to kind of hold typing in your questions until closer to the end of the presentation. Uh, I'll moderate the discussion of as many of those questions as our time allows. So, Phil and Lorna, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Stuart. Uh, my name is Lorna Campbell. Um, I'm based in Scotland. I'm here in Glasgow in Scotland, and Phil is over on the other side of the country in Edinburgh. And I'm just going to quickly give a brief outline of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to begin with a bit of background about the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative. Then I'll hand over to Phil, who will provide a technical overview of the specification. And then we'll have a look at some example implementations of the spec uh, before Phil starts um, looking at where this development will go next. And hopefully we can start to engage some of your questions then. So, a bit of background. We're here today to talk about the Learning Resource Meta Metadata Initiative. But one of the main questions is, well, why create another metadata standard? This is a very crowded space. We're all aware that there are plenty of other metadata standards out there. In fact, pretty much everyone who's involved in developing LRMI has got some background in education metadata development. Many of us have been involved in the development of existing specifications and standards, including the IEEE LOM, the IMS Learning Resource Metadata Specification, and of course, Dublin Core. The whole um, impetus to uh, learning resource metadata was um, sparked by developments of schema.org. And schema.org is a joint initiative uh, promoted by Google, Yahoo, Microsoft Bing, Yandex, and W3C that aims to help improve search engines, uh, interpret information on web pages, and improve the way they display search results, ultimately making it easier for people to find the information that they need. Now, LRMI builds on schema.org, and the way it began was as a funded three-phase project um, with funding by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The project phase of LRMI was led by Creative Commons and the Association of Education Publishers, and CETUS were subcontracted by Creative Commons uh, to manage the open education aspects of the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative. Uh, the working group included a wide range of educators, publishers, and metadata specialists, uh, and the specification itself is now governed by the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. So that's a bit of background about how LRMI, the initiative, was developed, but what does LRMI actually do? 
Well, the aim of LRMI is to make it easier for teachers and learners to find educational materials through major search engines and specialised resource discovery services. So it's not about replicating or replacing existing learning resource metadata specifications. It's doing a slightly different job. And how does LRMI do that? Well, it does that by extending the schema.org ontology in order to allow the description of educationally important properties of resources to be marked up on the web in a manner that can be easily understood by search engines. And the way it does that is by adding education properties uh, to the item type creative work within schema.org. So that's how LRMI started off. And what LRMI is now is a specification, so we've completed the first phase of the work and there is now a specification based on schema.org that can be, used, can be used to describe learning resources. The funded phase of the project, the three phases of funding from the Gates Foundation, has come to an end. However, the work is continuing and has been sustained by a community of people who are interested in furthering the development of the specification through uh, the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. So I'm now going to pass over uh, to my colleague Phil Barker in Edinburgh and he's going to provide um, a technical overview of the specification. Hello everybody, good morning or good afternoon depending on where you are. Um, We've already heard from Lorna that LRMI aims to make it easier for teachers and learners to find educational materials through major search engines and specialised resource discovery services. I'd like to give a little bit of motivation behind the approach that we took in doing that. Um, I'd like you to consider Pam. Here's a photograph of Pam. Let's imagine that she wants to teach a lesson about the declaration of our growth. Um, and she needs some resources to help her teach that lesson. She goes to try and find some of these resources. Um, she might search Google and she'll find an awful lot of very useful information resources about the Declaration of Our Growth. But some of these she would already have known about. Um, you probably don't need Google to, to find the Wikipedia page on the Declaration of Our Growth. Others Others um, are resources that while they've got very good information, they won't be targeted at her specific students. Uh, let's imagine that she is teaching, say, 14-year-old students. It's to be a history lesson. It has to link into the uh, local curriculum that's taught in the schools where, where Pam teaches. Um, so there are a whole load of parameters that Pam might use to narrow down the search results to something which is more appropriate to her specific context, but which Google doesn't support, which Google doesn't make. It's easy for her to filter these results down to meet her specific needs. And so she's kind of forced into a world of um, specialized search services, which are often based on, on siloed metadata. Uh, an example of one of these, a very good one of these that's available in the UK is the Times Education Supplement Connect and it illustrates some of the sort of properties that are used in these um, search services to help teachers find resources that are specifically useful for them. Uh, this particular one that I, I've, I'm showing shows how there's a link between the educational level that's being addressed. Uh, this appears in two places. The term secondary here relates to secondary schools and the terms KS3, KS4 and post-16 are levels within the English national curriculum and then underneath each of those levels you've got topics which are taught in the English national curriculum and through this Pam could perhaps find a resource that was useful for her, her, her particular lesson that she wanted to teach. Other examples which I could show you would divide materials perhaps by learning resource types so that Pam maybe could find a lesson plan if she was looking for a lesson plan or she could maybe find a, an assessment or an assignment to give to her students. Now why can't Google do this filtering? Um, I'll give you an illustration of some of the problems that um, Google has in interpreting what text on web pages actually means. 
by showing this screenshot from Google Scholar, which identifies an author as Jay Cetus, um, a co-author of mine, in fact. If you look at the Learning Material Application Profile Scoping Study, you'll see that it is by me and Jay Cetus. Well, Jay Cetus is none other than JISC Cetus. It's the former name for the organization for which Lorna and I work. And what we're seeing here is that Google has difficulty interpreting strings of text to identify whether they relate to the name of an author or the organization to which an author is affiliated. Um, Google knows that people are searching for, in their words, things not strings, um, but they also recognize that they need help in identifying uh, what thing a string that's in their index actually refers to. And in order to deal with this problem, they um, got together with um, Bing and Yahoo and Yandex ultimately to create schema.org. Um, a human being looking at a website will see something along these lines. Uh, here's a website for a publication which has me as author, Lorna as co-author. Um, uh, we're both working for Cetus. It makes perfect sense to a human being what this is. What a computer sees with this text is the following HTML, simplified somewhat, um, but you can see that there's a heading there that gives what happens to be the title of the resource, and there are a couple of paragraphs that gives information about Lorna and myself. What the computer needs is something like this, a nice graph that's identifying the types of resources um, that are being spoken about on that web page. Um, the primary resource in this case is a, a scholarly work which has a, a particular name and there are two other um, there, there are two as an other entities that are related to that scholarly work by being the authors of it that is to say Lorna and myself and we both have names and we both have affiliations. What schema.org provides in order to help the computer get from the HTML to that graph is an agreed hierarchy of resource types um, starting at the top level with thing and then everything underneath that um, is a more specific type of resource whether it's a person, a creative work, an organization or, or one of many others and an agreed vocabulary for naming the characteristics of these resource types. Um, and the hierarchy means that everything in the vocabulary uh, that names a characteristic of a thing is inherited by those subtypes underneath it. So everything has, for example, a name, a description, and a URL, which means that every person inherits from the thing type a name, a description, and a URL. This information can be added to HTML in one of three formats, microdata, RDFA, JSON-LD, to help computers understand what the text and string within that HTML actually means. So, building on the example that I showed earlier of that web page describing a publication of Lorna and myself, um, to use schema.org to build up that graph, we first of all identify everything within the relevant division as being an individual item of type schema.org scholarly work. We can then give that item a name, which in this case is the title of the scholarly article, and we can say that there are relationships to other items. In this case, there's a relationship to the author, which in it is itself an item of type schema.org person, and that person has a name, which is Phil Barker, and an affiliation. So you see here we are addressing that problem that I um, illustrated on the Google Scholar page of, the, of Google not being able to identify whether a particular piece of text related to the name of a person or the affiliation of that person. So, what schema.org didn't have was any way of naming the educational parameters that might have helped Pam narrow down her search. Uh, and this is what the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative added. Um, 
we added several properties, um, some of which were quite simple and don't take much discussion apart from the, uh, the, the definition of them. Um, educational use, for example, is simply the type of use to which a resource might be used in an educational context. Um, the learning resource type is the type of resource, so you know, whether it's a lesson, lesson plan or whether it's um, an educational simulation or an educational game. Uh, typical time required to use a resource is useful if you're wanting to select a resource that will maybe take up um, five or ten minutes at the beginning of a lesson or whether you're looking for something that will provide um, 12 whole lessons worth a, a course if you like. The one that does take a little bit more explanation is educational alignment. Educational alignment is an alignment to an established educational framework. This might be a shared curriculum or syllabus, it might be a shared framework of competency requirements, it might be a set of educational levels, or it might be a set of modules that make up a course. And the educational alignment allows you to encode statements along the lines of, this resource teaches subject X, or teaches a particular item in a shared curriculum, or this resource assesses that particular item, or it might be a, to, used to express a prerequisite, this resource requires knowledge of topic Y. Graphically, the way it's implemented looks something like this. Um, the, creative work, the creative work has an educational alignment uh, that points to an alignment object, and the alignment object identifies the type of alignment, that is whether the resource is useful for teaching or assessing, or whether it has a prerequisite, and it identifies the framework for which the, to which the resource aligns, and the particular node within that framework to which the resource aligns. What I need to make clear is that the LRMI elements aren't intended to describe the educational framework. If you have an educational framework and you try to describe it with the elements that we added to schema.org, you find that you won't get very far. What we're trying to do is to identify a particular point within an educational framework, not the relationships between that point and the framework in general or other nodes within the framework. That's still quite abstract. So let me give you a more concrete example, which is from a resource discovery service uh, called Criticos that's run out of the University of Liverpool in the UK. Um, I've used it here to find a resource called Angle Between Two Lines. Um, that is a resource on SlideShare. But it's the additional information that can be provided um, about that resource, in this case, in the case of Criticos, by users of the search service. So here we have the information that has been provided by a year one um, student at the University of Sheffield who recommends this resource for their Mathematics of Materials module. And if you unpick a little bit the information that's provided behind those links, you can express that as an alignment between the resource, the, the presentation on the angle between two lines, and a module in the University of Sheffield course. And it works like this. Um, the resource called angle between two lines teaches something that is identified as a part of the framework University of Sheffield modules, and that part of the framework has the name MAS 153 Mathematics, brackets materials, and the URL that's here. So the, align the alignment object is providing information both on the nature of the educational alignment and the particular node to which the resource aligns. Other alignments that can be expressed, um, a few examples of them, um, are that 
you, you might choose to align, express an alignment to any other framework of, of competencies or shared curriculum, for example, the, the common core. So you can say that the resource teaches something from the common core that has the target name css.math.content.7, blah, blah, blah. Or you might express an alignment of type educational level for example, to a thing that we have here in Scotland that's called the Scottish Credit and Qualifications Framework um, to, 11, to, to level 10, which is undergraduate level. Unfortunately, the, the SQF doesn't provide target URLs, so you can't provide a URL for that. Um, you can provide alignments that express the reading level of a resource, perhaps using the Lexans Framework. Um, you could say that a resource assesses a particular level, for example, a, um, a competency level within the, the UK standard for professional engineering competencies, um, or that a resource has a particular educational subject, um, perhaps within the UK's joint academic coding scheme. So, just a reminder that while I've spoken for education on the line, alignment quite a bit, um, mostly because it's complicated, but also very, very powerful. Um, LRMI added several other resource, several other properties to schema.org. Having done that, what's needed for the success of LRMI is firstly for more resource publishers, for more resource dissemination channels for more resource authors to use LRMI to mark up their resources with descriptions in LRMI and also firstly for more search services to make use of that metadata and this really is a, a chicken and egg situation where there is uh, little benefit I guess little motivation for either the resource disseminators or the search services to do what they need to do first before the other party um, before the other party starts using LRMI. I'll now go over to pass over to Lorna, um, who will talk on some of the example implementations that try to address the first part of that um, th those two requirements. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Hopefully you can now see my screen. Um, so I mentioned um, in my introduction that the Learning Resource Metadata Initiative project was initially funded by the Gates Foundation. As part of that funding, during the second year of the project, the Gates Foundation, together with the Hewlett Foundation, provided additional funding to Creative Commons uh, to give out small project grants to 10 open educational resource platforms in order to kickstart LRMI implementation. One of the things I'll add just very briefly is that one of the things that was quite interesting about the way LRMI was funded and developed was that it was very, very much a partnership between open education initiatives and the commercial publishing sector. So the project was managed by both Creative Commons and the Association of Education Publishers. And I think this was a really good way to drive the development forward. So during phase two of LRMI, these 10 OER platforms had a small amount of funding in order to implement LRMI in whatever way they chose. So those 10 platforms were Kariki, Guru Learning, OER Commons, OpenStack CNX, Open Tapestry, Joram, Merlot, Peer-to-Peer -peer University, FET Interactive Simulations, and UntrickyWiki. Nine of the, these uh, platforms are based in the US. Joram is based here in the UK. Um, as part of our work with Creative Commons, um, Phil and I uh, reviewed all 10 implementations, and we've written case studies on all 10 projects. And you can access um, a write-up of these 10 case studies uh, on the Open World blog here. 
uh, we're also in the process of synthesizing the outputs of these projects to learn what we can about the technical implementations and we'll make the synthesis available shortly. We've actually already completed that work but we just need to uh, finish the formatting so we can release the, the documentation. So the main findings um, of the technical implementation projects was that very, very few of the platforms used LRMI as their native metadata schema. And perhaps this is to be expected because these were all existing platforms that already had metadata um, that they were using internally to manage their resources. Um, so most already had internal customized metadata schema. And the way they implemented LRMI was transforming their existing metadata out to LRMI properties. Um, another interesting factor of the implementations was that most of these open educational resource platforms rely on third parties for the creation of the metadata that they hold. So in most instances, metadata is either harvested from other repositories, as in the case of OER aggregators, or it's created by users that are submitting resources to the OER repository. So to some extent, uh, these OER platforms have very, very little control over the metadata that they're gathering. Uh, so the volume and the quality of the metadata varies widely right across these 10 platforms. Uh, so when we say that these platforms implemented LRMI, that does vary enormously. Many of these platforms give their users the option to, um, to use LRMI, but that doesn't necessarily say that they did in every single occasion on every single resource. Um, and obviously this is a common issue across all different kinds of repositories, and this is not an issue that's inherent with LRMI or any other particular specification. It's really about the way that metadata is created, curated, and maintained. And one of the things um, that we discovered about these 10 OER platforms is very, very few of them have formal metadata curation workflows. And I think this is one area where uh, open educational resource platforms perhaps differ quite significantly from platforms that disseminate other types of resources, whether that's scholarly works or uh, public commercial publications or perhaps even training materials. So again, this means that the, the quality and the breadth and the depth of the metadata that's recorded is very, very variable. Um, one of the other issues um, that uh, the platforms uncovered was that it's not always easy to embed LRMI microdata in resource pages. Quite often the repository is controlling how those pages are displayed, and this is particularly an issue in DSpace. In other cases, it was more the point that um, the repositories are pointing out to other resources that are held on servers elsewhere. So unless you can create a jumping off page in which to embed the LRMI microdata, it can be quite difficult um, to actually get that data in there. Um, but these are all issues and uh, that the, the, the 10 projects all grappled with, and pretty much all of them managed to overcome these issues. Um, and we were quite pleased um, that at the end of the day, very few of the platforms uh, reported any specific problems with implementing the LRMI specification. In fact, many of them commented that it was actually very, very straightforward um, to use and to implement in comparison to other specifications. And they all reported that um, they found it uh, useful to be what, that, what they described as being the cutting edge of metadata technology. Um, I think it's too early yet um, to see real measurable benefits from implementing LRMI, um, but certainly all the projects reported that they found the, the, the process of being involved in these projects quite beneficial. So those were projects that were funded as part of the LRMI um, uh, project, but there are actually a lot of other implementations of LRMI out there in the wild. 
I'm not going to go through all of these. We'll make the slides available after the, se the, the webinar. Uh, do feel free to go and have a look at them afterwards. Um, I'll just very briefly highlight one or two. Um, Solvonauts um, is quite an interesting open education search engine, and I think it demonstrates quite nicely the potential value of um, LRMI for surfacing open educational resources. Uh, I've been focusing in, over the last couple of minutes on uh, implementation of LRMI by um, platforms and developers who are particularly interested in open education resources. But as I mentioned earlier, LRMI has also been quite widely adopted by the publisher community. Um, quite a wide range of commercial publishers have adopted LRMI, um, including various parts of uh, Pearson. In some cases, uh, they have used LRMI to disseminate their resources, but in other cases, they're using LRMI actually to manage their resources internally within the, the companies, and I believe that's the approach that Pearson have taken. And it's also worth mentioning um, that um, the educational metadata in the draft EPUB3 EduPub profile is also based on LRMI properties. So I think there are some really interesting affordances there of using LRMI within um, EPUB3 ebooks within the education community. Another significant implementation of LRMI is by the Learning Registry. Um, the Learning Registry was originally um, a project funded jointly by the US Department of Defense and the US Department of Education, uh, who it's still maintained by. And the Learning Registry offers a new approach to capturing, connecting, and sharing data about learning resources, and making that data available online. Uh, I once heard the, the Learning Registry described as social networking for learning resource metadata. And one of the things that's significant um, about the way the Learning Registry has implemented LRMI is that it's used it in the form of JSON-LD records as its base metadata schema. So these are just a few examples of how LRMI has already been implemented. It's still a very young specification. Um, it's nice to see it being picked up and implemented so widely already. As I said, many of us who have been involved in the development of LRMI have prior form or prior experience of other uh, metadata standards. Um, and clearly, um, we're very encouraged by the fact that uh, LRMI has been adopted um, so readily. But we also need to ensure that it's been adopted by search engines, because as Phil said, this is very much just one side um, of the implementation uh, requirements. Uh, so I'm now going to hopefully pass over to Phil, who will say a little bit about implementation and adoption of LRMI by search engines. Okay, hopefully over to you, Phil. Yes, implementation by search engines. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you won't see implementation by the big search engines until there's some sort of web scale implementation by resource providers. Um, but just as you can start to bootstrap the process of implementation by resource providers by providing some, some project funding and by in, encouraging um, individual implementers to implement um, LRMI within their resources. Um, you can hopefully also bootstrap the um, um, bootstrap the, the search process by building smaller, more, more, more specialized search engines. Uh, and the Learning Registry is an example of one such search engine. Um, another approach to building these smaller specialized search engines is using Google Custom Searches. Um, Google Custom Search um, is a way that allows you to build Google-powered searches that are limited to a list of domains or specific schema.org types and are filtered or can be filtered according to schema.org properties. So for example, you might limit it searches to pages, web pages that have got an alignment object, 
because you can be fairly clear that these are pages that describe learning resources, that there's no other user, no other reason to express an educational alignment. Or you might want to filter by alignment with um, what it is that you want to be learned. Here's a screenshot from the Google Custom Search Engine interface, which shows down at the bottom here how you can restrict pages using schema.org types, using, uh, as I mentioned to mentioned previously, the alignment object. Um, and here's an example showing how you can go to the search, feature, search features refinements panel on Google Custom Search Engine, and you can add refinements to particular educational levels. Um, GCSE is an educational level within the UK, primarily within England. Intermediate university level is one that's more general, um, self-explanatory. Um, and finally, US grade six, for those of you who are in America will immediately recognize what that means. These alignments are expressed in a, um, a rather tortured syntax within um, the Google Custom Search Engine, so I thought it might be useful just to show you briefly what that looks like when you're editing it within a Google Custom Search Engine. What it means for somebody like Pam um, is that she can now search for Declaration of Our Growth, and as well as rather than getting very many um, information resources which she has no way of filtering to her specific context. She can now say, okay, I'm teaching GCSE level. So I want to pick those resources for which a specific educational alignment has been expressed to GCSE. And what she finds are these three resources um, from the BBC which are top one is about the declaration of our growth. The next two are about um, some of the context within which it happened. So that is immediately giving her something which is more tailored to her specific, her specific needs. Um, at the moment, I have to stress that the search engine that we created in order to find these resources is just a, a demonstrator. You know, it's not intended to be a um, a, a usable service. It, it merely in, illustrates how LRMI can be used to build Google custom search engines that will um, pick out resources um, that align to specific contexts. There's a link to it at the bottom. Uh, you're welcome to go and play with that when you get copies of the slides. Google themselves have also had a go at building a custom search engine for education. In many ways, the implementation is um, uh, much more, um, much cleverer than we ourselves could do, um, but they chose to limit the filters that can be applied to uh, a simple one of typical age range, which is one of the LRMI properties. But this is also an interesting one to have a look at. So we've discussed the, the background to LRMI, the um, background to it as an initiative, what sparked it off. We've discussed what it did and in terms of adding um, properties to the schema.org specification. And we've discussed how it has been implemented both by uh, resource publishers, uh, dissemination channels, and also how it might be implemented within search engines. So. What remains for us to talk about is where next, what happens next with LRMI. Remember, LRMI is both a metadata specification that's based on schema, um, and it is also a community of people who are interested in using that specification, uh, and perhaps interested in developing it. As of last month, um, the leadership for Learning Resource Metadata Initiative passed from um, Creative Commons and the Association of Education Publishers, who, who'd been responsible for it while it was a project, to the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. Within DCMI, the stability of the current specification um, is guaranteed through DCMI's governance procedures, and we will also be creating an RDF expression of, of that specification. 
we will be coordinating the current community um, within the LLMI group, which at the moment communicates as a, a, a Google group. That there will be a link to that at the end with the existing TCMI education community. And future developments of LLMI will be in accordance with DCMI's governance procedures for making sure that there is a real need for any further development um, and that the, um, the, the reaction to, to that need does in fact produce a, a useful improvement on spec that, that meets the, the need that's been identified. Possible future developments. Now, the, the first thing that I really want to stress here is that everything apart from the first bullet point has got a question mark after it. The current properties are stable. That's unquestionable. Uh, what you can do with LRMI, the way it's used at the moment, is going to stay the same. If you implement LRMI now, we're not going to come out with um, a new version that makes that implementation invalid. However, there are certain changes that might be made to LRMI that um, maintain that stability. For example, there's one issue that we really should clarify. I've presented the introduction in terms of page markup the way that um, schema.org works. But LRMI is also being used as a record format, or can be used as a record format. So we need to clarify the, um, I, I think, the fact that it can be used both ways. Um, we probably need to discuss whether we recommend using it one way or the other. Um, but it may be that it is enough just to clarify that it can be used in both ways, but that what it does when you use it either as a as page markup for consumption by search engines or as an internal record format, those are two distinct uses that are using LRMI in, in different ways. Um, and that will clarify, I think, certain assumptions that are behind some of the questions that we get asked about LRMI. We can certainly provide more help on the value spaces for properties. We, we've provided several new properties with schema.org that help you express something like learning resource type. What we have not done is provided a vocabulary of learning resource types that, that, that can be used. Partly that's because um, LRMI is a global initiative. Um, there isn't going to be global agreement on what a value space for learning resource types is. Um, but I think we could provide more help on what are sensible values for each of these properties and more information about what are the values that are being used by other implementers of LRMI. Currently, LRMI properties only apply to creative works. There's another type of thing, type of class of results within schema.org um, called events that aren't covered by LRMI. Yet clearly you can have educational events. Clearly you can say the same sort of things about educational events as you can say about educational creative works. So we could ex extend the coverage of LRMI to include events. Another extension that could be made is to cover courses. Now we'd need to have a certain amount of discussion about what exactly is an educational course but several proposals have already been put forward to schema.org that touch on this. For example, for the description of MOOCs or the description of online courses in general. Um, I think it would be sensible to make sure that we cover all types of courses, at least as far as is feasible, um, and include those as special cases. There's also going to, well, there are continually changes within schema.org or of the type of nature that I've outlined for, that could happen for LRMI. So people are always adding, continually adding um, new types of resource and new properties into schema.org to allow it to express new types of relationship. Um, some very good work has been going on recently to express uh, bibliographic properties within schema.org. Several of those are relevant to learning resources. Some of them um, relate to some of the properties that are already within LRMI. And I think we need to 
keep an eye on changes that happen within schema.org to react to those changes in a way that um, enhances the, the, the power of LRMI within schema. Enhances the power to express these properties, uh, the, these educational properties of learning resources. And finally, other new properties that might be added. Um, I'm pretty sure that everybody who's interested in learning resource metadata has their own favorite property um, that they'd like to add. You know, perhaps we could add more to the alignment object, uh, the alignment object than is currently in there. For example, at the moment we can't say who it was who expressed, who asserted that a particular alignment exists. That might be useful information for some people to have. So the field is open for future developments. Um, these all have to be carried out within the, the governance procedures of Dublin Core um, to make sure that we proceed on the basis of consensus and of addressing real needs rather than just adding things that seem that might be nice, but perhaps won't get used. There's a screen for some further information. What I'd like to do now is pass over to Stuart um, for some of these questions that I hope you have been asking. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Lorna. Um, uh, we're open for questions. Uh, you can uh, type your questions in to the, uh, uh, the box provided there on the screen, and we will address them as they come in. Um, I'm hold for a few moments. Well, maybe while they're holding, let me um, ask a question of, of uh, perhaps Lorna. Um, in one of your slides, you said that few platforms used LRMI as their native metadata schema. Wasn't uh, was that part of the uh, part? Wasn't that part of the original assumption that it was markup, and that it would not replace? It? Was that part of the first uh, the original assumption? I think, in terms of the brief that was given to the projects, it was left very very open as to how they wanted to implement LRMI. And you're, you're absolutely right. I don't think we expected to see many platforms uh, adopting LRMI as their native um, metadata schema. In fact, I was actually surprised that one of them did. Um, I'm just trying to recall which one it was. I believe it's peer-to-peer -peer university. I think LRMI is the only metadata that they actually use. Um, so yes, to some extent, it, it's that does very much replicate what we expected, um, but I think it, it's interesting in that when we talk about LRMI implementation, that means something slightly different from when we talk about, for example, LOM implementation or Dublin Core implementation. Correct. One being a, an implementation of a record format. Absolutely. For storage, storage, processing, curation, and um, uh, uh, others for, uh, uh, as opposed to markup from an existing data store. Absolutely. It's maybe worth pointing out at this stage, though, that I think, I haven't actually got precise data on this um, because we haven't done case studies in this area, but I think perhaps in the publisher community, LRMI is being used more commonly as a record format rather than as a markup format. Like I say, that that's that's supposition. We haven't we haven't done the research there, but that's the impression I get. And as Phil said, there is some ambiguity um, as to well, what is LRMI? Is it a markup format? Is it for creating metadata records? Well, in actual fact, it can be used for both. Um, and I think that is perhaps an area where we do maybe need to provide a little more guidance um, just to explain you know, that yes, it can be used as both, but under what circumstances you might want to use it. Very good. Thank you. Um, I have a question. It says, first of all, hi, thank you very much for a great presentation. One question, please. Is it easy for those using LOAM or EDM, European Data Model, uh, to adapt to LRMI? I assume perhaps that... Um, shall I pick up that one initially, Phil? 
You can. Yes. Yeah. It seems to be it seems to be very simple. Um, of the of the OER implementation projects that I mentioned, um, most of them already had, as I said, custom schema. Um, none of them said we use just LOM or just Dublin Core, but most of them used um, internal custom schema based heavily or one on one or the other. And it's very very easy to uh, transform. I think from LOM to LRMI. As I also mentioned, and I'll maybe pass over to Phil's comment on this as well, many of the people who were initially involved in the LRMI technical working group had prior experience of developing both IEEE LOM and Dublin Core, so there was a lot of the same thinking went into LRMI and that we, tr we hopefully um, adopted some of the um, the more commonly used ideas and uh, terminology of those specifications and in that way I think quite a lot of the terminology that's used in LRMI will be very familiar. Would you say that's correct Phil? I think that's very correct. Several of the properties that LRMI added into schema.org um, have the same names and very similar definitions to those from the LOM. So when we talk about the LRMI time required property, that's the same as um, a property in the LOM. Um, I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's, it's very similar. Um, likewise, interactivity type um, and learning resource type are very similar to those that are in the LOM. Um, one that's slightly different is the educational alignment that I spoke to. It is possible to do that in the long through um, um, uh, through the, the classification um, part of the long, um, but I'm not sure if it's done very widely. I have another question. Um, the custom search engine that I see described at, and unfortunately it's a long URL that I can't give you, uh, seems to be targeted to place a Google search engine on one's website, which seems to be a different functionality than what you are demonstrating in the slides uh, where you used a custom Google search. I think it's probably the same Google custom search. Um, one of the most common uses of the Google custom search engine is to limit the scope of a Google search to a particular domain, which makes an obvious use of that, of Google custom search engines being to um, search just your own site. Um, you know, the next step up from that is to search a, a group of sites that you know are, are relevant to your, your, your website users, or that you know, currently we would, would say a group of sites that you know provide good learning resources, for example. Um, but you can do these other things as well using the same custom search engine. I have another question. Uh, uh, to be successful, LRMI will need to be implemented widely. This means several issues will have to be addressed. Here are three issues. One, demonstrated benefits. Two, partners who are committed to LRMI and three, machine assistance in creating LMI records and transforming existing metadata into LRMI, a community of practice. Please tell us how you plan to address these issues. Um, if I could pick up on the second of these issues, um, I think we do have already a community of practice that is committed um, to developing and furthering LRMI um, and I think the fact that uh, Dublin Core is now involved in stewarding the specification forward is hugely positive. Um, clearly DCMI has an excellent track record in engaging um, education developers and uh, technologists and metadata specialists around the development of metadata specifications so I think if LRMI can thrive anywhere, then it's absolutely within um, the Dublin Core Metadata Initiative. Um, and we're very pleased that many of the people that were initially involved in the LRMI Technical Working Group are still um, involved in the new DCMI LRMI Task Group. 
I just want to very quickly mention um, the first um, point. There, there is a real sort of chicken and an egg situation here. We need to have a significant volume um, of implementation. Um, and we are very much engaged with search engines. Phil did mention that it's very difficult to predict what the search engines are going to do, um, particularly Google. I think we all know that. Um, but we're very pleased that um, we are in communication with Google. Um, we've got very good relationships with some of the people and some of the developers there, and we know that they're, they're interested in LRMI as being a good way forward to facilitating um, custom search of education resources. Beyond that, it's difficult to say what will happen, um, but we certainly are trying to um, you know, encourage the search engines as much as possible um, to continue to be engaged um, with LRMI development. Phil, is there anything you want to add to that? Uh, yes, um, just say a little bit about the, um, the machine assistance in creating the metadata. Um, that's one of the places where it's enormously useful to be linked with schema.org because schema.org is um, a very large metadata initiative. It is used by very, very many um, uh, web page web webmasters, web websites, uh, web page providers. Um, Google say Google report that they are seeing um, schema.org markup on you know, significant percentages of, of the web um, as a whole. Um, millions and millions of pages. And so the link with schema.org means that any um, any tool that helps you put schema.org web markup onto your website will also help you put LRMI markup onto your website. Perhaps not when it comes to you know, specific values for what goes into the properties, but in terms of being able to add these properties um, onto web pages, you, you will get that help through any tool that supports the whole of schema.org. Uh, I think the same also applies to demonstrated benefit because while um, Google at the moment doesn't support the LRMI properties, if you're describing a resource using LRMI through schema.org, um, you will in be including things like a name and a description of the resource, which are things that Google does recognize. Thank you. Another question. You say that it that LRMI is being used for uh, both markup and as record structure. What's the how do people who are using it as record structure consider it in terms of sufficiency? A markup language is brief; records can be long and deep. That's a very good question, and to be perfectly honest, I would struggle to answer that one. Um, as I said, um, I think it's more commonly used for records um, in the publisher community. Um, I can really only speak for the OER platforms, and as I said, I think it was Peer to Peer U that implemented it. Um, as their native metadata format, and one of the reason, one of the things they liked about it was that it was very brief, and they wanted something that was very, very concise. Um, beyond that, I would hesitate really to say we, like I said, we would need to actually go and do some research out in the publisher community. If we had somebody from um, the Association of Education Publishers here, our partners um, in the development of LRMI, they would be much better place to answer that question. But I'm not sure, Phil, is there anything that you can add to that? I'll make one comment, which is that while records can be long and detailed, very often they are brief. Correct. <laughs> yes. Another question. If we are starting from scratch with a customized schema, originally rooted in PB Core, uh, do you recommend RDF or Microdata or LRMI markup? LRMI can be expressed as RDF A or Microdata. Um, 
in general, my advice is go for whichever you have the more expertise in. Um, and go for the format which the people who are consuming the metadata say that they would prefer. Um, if your target consumers are Google, they so far have not expressed a preference. They say that they will treat the two as equivalent. Another question. It seems that we are still at the proof of concept stage. Do you have plans to generate a large corpus of data and provide an environment for us to experiment with LRMI? That depends on who the questioner means as you. Um, I think Lorna and I personally won't be. Um, I think <laughs> that uh, if you broaden it out to mean the um, the, the you know, community that is LOMI as a whole, I think we already do have a large corpus of data. Um, yeah, if I can just jump in there. Sorry, I was trying to. I was trying to desperately trying to unmute to answer that question. I mean, I think, I think we've gone beyond proof of concept. I think we're probably at the early adoption phase. Um, as I said, we, ha we are starting to see LRMI adoption out there in the wild. Um, the specification is, um, the specification itself has only been a, a, around in its approved format for just over a year, I think. So it, it is early days, but I would say that it's very much early adoption rather than proof of concept. Um, but it is a community specification. This is one of the things that's quite interesting about LRMI, is it was a very open development. Um, it was developed in the open, and uh, as I said, there was some funding attached to the development in the initial phase, pretty much to kick-start it and get you know, the first version of the specification out there. It's not funded at the moment, but it does have, more importantly, uh, a community of users. It does have a small user base that hopefully is growing, and there is very much an active community of developers around the specification. And I think any of us that have been involved in um, any kind of specification know that that's really important. And I think at this early stage of implementation, the most critical factor is to get a good lively community involved um, around the spec um, so that there is you know development and enthusiasm and sort of you know lots of implementation work going on. I mentioned the learning registry earlier on. Um, they've been doing a lot of really good work um, and they're possibly one of the largest implementations of LRMI. Um, and they do actually provide sandbox facilities where you can go in and, and you, you can play around with the learning registry and with the data they have. Um, that's one very specific implementation, but you know, they do provide that kind of functionality. Um, and as I said earlier, I think you know, we're, we're very pleased that DCMI has um, got involved in stewarding LRMI my going forward because I think you know hopefully we will be able to uh, really promote the uptake and the implementation of the spec and develop it further. If I may jump in and maybe add a little bit, uh, this is Stuart. Um, as to, I, I, I think I agree with you Lorna that it is past proof of concept. Um, uh, the plans uh, to generate large corpus I think are moving probably at a speed um, that is a little surprising, in fact, for a new specification. Um, uh, the, LR, the, uh, the learning registry is, is not small, and the other places where it is being adopted are also large. But I think the real key for scalability here comes back to, um, to what Phil pointed out, and that is the relationship to, to schema.org. It's quite obvious we've had generations of, or several generations probably, of, 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 of metadata specifications for learning resources. And, and none of them, none of them have been picked up by the search engines. The search engines didn't pick up Loam. They didn't pick up Dublin Core and really run with it. Um, so, it so the very fact that schema.org involves a commitment of the search engines uh, 
an agreement that they around a dictionary of terms that they will that they will put trust in for the first time that they will put trust in and the fact that that LRMI has been adopted by schema.org for the description of learning resources I think portends well I think it indicates that the probabilities are very are 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 I would say at this point in time higher than the adoption of Loam or the adoption of any other specification by the search engines. So that very act of these three search engines getting together and for the first time deciding that there would be a vocabulary that they would use to um, uh, uh, to and in. And and let people know that they're going to use uh, for uh, for markup. I think uh, changes the game. It changes the adoption game considerably. That does not mean that we don't need a lot more resources um, uh, either natively in 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 LRMI data stores if that's what people want, or marked up out of existing data stores. Um, so I think it's, 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 it's a slightly different game than if we were trying to make the same, um, uh, uh, the same proposition for the Loam or for the Dublin Core. And uh, some of us have a lot invested in Loam and Dublin Core and those, those other, other, uh, other schemas. So I have one more question. And then I think we will we will call it a day. Uh, you mentioned the obvious need to develop value vocabularies. Are working groups currently working on this initiative? Would you like me to take that one, guys? I was going to say yes. <laughs> or if you would like to take it. The, the uh, no, short no. answer, yeah, the short answer is no, isn't it, student Stuart? Um, that the long answer is tied up in what we do within Dublin Core, which is. Um, a good one for you to pick on. Yes, I mean, the, 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 if you've watched Dublin Core over the years, you'll note that Dublin Core has done very little to move down a path uh, with value vocabularies. Um, uh, there is considerable interest within the initiative to, in fact, begin to provide some form of community space DCMI community space for value vocabularies. The conversation is still early. There is pressure, um, uh, good pressure, uh, pressure to be appreciated, uh, coming from um, the again from the schema.org side because schema.org side has a great need for uh, for there to be value vocabularies. Those of us here uh, in this webinar understand the value of them and how they can improve um, uh, uh, the reliability of our, of, our, of our searches and so forth. So it is very much on the agenda uh, to discuss and, of course, being faced with resource needs and resourcing an activity. We always have that to consider. But um, uh, yes, Sherry, I think that uh, uh, you know there is a possibility we have within the within DCMI to talk through how we resource it and how it would work. But uh, it's key. I think I think it's key. I, if I can add one thing to that, which is that for some of the properties, I think it would be very sensible and reasonably simple to come up with um, recommended value spaces, um, and there are others where it would be completely inappropriate. Um, so, for example, when you're talking about educational alignment to a, um, a, a node in an educational framework, you, you can't specify what that node is going to be and what the educational framework is going to be called, but what you can do is encourage the providers of those educational frameworks um, to give you that information in a, a sensible format. And Phil, I, I, I think you're absolutely correct. There are value vocabularies in the education domain um, that are not universal, that are very jurisdictional. 
when we talk about education levels in France, we use very different terminologies, not only linguistic, but very different language, but very different um, terminology to denote those. And we will never get past that. And we will never get past it. Um, so it could be a combination of both general vocabularies that, um, that many are more accustomed to and always want to seek. But it could also mean a mechanism for these people who are, who are authoring these vo value vocabularies to reliably publish them in a way that they're useful in this context. So it, it, so it wouldn't necessarily mean that we all adopt the same language. So it may be a combination of some general universal languages, value, value, um, um, uh, value, language, value vocabularies, but also a place where, um, uh, where others can, in fact, um, register uh, a, a, national, uh, a national vocabulary or even the vocabulary of a school district. I mean, you know, so, so I don't think we all have to speak the same vocabulary. Right in order to support it, uh, in, in order to support the need for those vocabularies. There are m the number of vocabularies that are technically useful in the open web is very small compared to the number of vocabularies that exist uh, that are in use. Okay, uh, it looks like, oh, Sherry, one last question. So develop a best practices. Not quite sure what what's being asked. Does that refer perhaps to, for example, I know that the um, the IMS uh, Learning Resource Metadata Specification is accompanied by a best practice and implementation guide. Um, maybe that's what the reference is to. I mean, I get, I guess that is the kind of thing that we could consider uh, taking forward. Okay. We're at 11 minutes after the hour, and so I think um, we will we will stop there. I want to thank our our two um, uh, presenters today, Phil Barker and Lorna Campbell, for uh, bringing us along with the latest stuff with LRMI, um, and thank all of you for uh, for joining us. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank bye you, bye. Stuart. Bye bye. Bye. For those still with us, the recording of the webinar and the presentation slides will be archived at aces.org and will be made available within 48 hours of today's live broadcast. And that is it from ACES and DCMI. Have a great day and a great week.